I'm Robert Williams from MetalRules.com, and joining me today in San Antonio at the press conference for the soon-to-be-released Earth's Blood album is Dallas Coyle, guitarist for God Forbid. How are you doing today, Dallas? I'm very good, man. The uh, press conference was good. You asked some very good questions. It was, uh, it's exciting to see people excited about the release. So thank you very much. Thank you, MetalRules.com. I appreciate it. Earth's Blood is the fifth God Forbid album to come out and the first full length since 2005. And um, you, you guys stated in, in the press recently that it's not a concept record, uh, it's not a hip to be green, environmentally sensitive album, it's more of an abstract observation. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, Last Record was a concept album, and uh, you know, it was good for what it was, but we, we really didn't want to put too much, make people think too much about like the concept and like pushing their face. We wanted to have something that was, um, you know, they can interpret for their own. And, uh, and we wanted to have not like, like nine, ten songs on the record that was just any metalhead can get into. Not like a progressive metalhead or, or a guy who just listens to metal for like all the, you know, like, you know what I mean? It's More like, yeah, yeah, you don't, we wanted to be able to grab like the Hatebreed fan. We wanted to be able to grab the Dream Theater fan. We wanted to be able to grab the Boulder fan. We wanted to be able to grab like the, you know, the Lamb of God fan, you know what I mean? And the best way to do that was, was to write nine songs, ten songs that fit apart from, it, from each other and really had an abstract nature so that people can interpret the album on their own. You know what I mean? And that's kind of like your whole mantra anyway, because you guys never make the same sounding album twice, right? Yeah, I mean, we don't. I mean, it's kind of funny, like, we always think that it's bands should do that, but most bands don't really do that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and this this one is like a lot different, you know, than our other records. So we're, I don't know, it's, it's just a, I, I don't know, like you, you, you start to learn more about a record as it gets older and older, you yeah. know what I mean? So right now it's so, I mean, the record is a year old for us because we went to go record a year ago, but now that it's done and people are able to hear it, they interpret it and then we get back what they think and we're like, wow, okay, cool, this is what we achieved, this is what we didn't achieve. This, these people liked it, these people didn't like it, and then we look at that and we say, okay, if we do another record, we say, what do we want to do this time that's different than this record, you know? Right. And then when you write that next record, this record seems different, you know? So Christian Oldie Wolbers, uh, Fear Factory guitarist now playing with Arkea, he did all the vocal tracking on the new album, and since he has a background, you know, as diverse as being in the hip-hop industry, and he can really... You know, he he knows when someone is you know not singing on the on the beat. You know, what was it like working with Christian on the, on the vocal stuff? But it was great working with Christian because like the record, the music was so diverse yeah. that we were having a hard time. Me and Byron like kind of agreeing on things, so he was a good mediator, and also like he was able, like I said, with the rhythms of things and making sure things worked out. Like he really just helped us get good performances, and he gave us a lot of time. You know, we needed a lot of time. We, it took us a month to do the vocals on this record. And usually it doesn't take us that long. So he was just, and he's easy to work with, and he's a good friend of ours, and he's a musician as well, so he understands, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and he's a good producer. He technically knows good sound. Like, the vocals on the record sound, they sound clear, you know what I mean? So we're, I mean, working with him was really cool. It was actually, I, I was hesitant at first just because he's a musician, you know what I mean? And like musicians like have created things, but it was great, you know. I, def, I would I would work with him again definitely. And was that in, in his studio where Fleetwood Mac used to record? No, we did it in the house, in, okay. in, in his house, you know. Because yeah. there's only vocals, we didn't have to do guitars or anything like that. Doc, Doc, sure did a, yeah, Doc did a solo in there, but, but you know. Bong was, hits every now and then? I don't smoke weed anymore. <laughs> and even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. This might go to court one day. I think with us being that we're not, you know, we're not the biggest band in the world, but we're not the smallest band. We're kind of like a, a working class, middle of the road type of type of band. And anytime you're in that position, you're basically any record could be your last because if you can't, you know, if you can't pay the bills, then you can't go on the road. You can't do the records. You, can, you know, so it's. I think every time we make a record, it's like well, if we don't really do a great job, then. You know that you know you're not gonna get those calls. You're on tour. You can't get the records in the stores. It's I mean you've seen it. You've seen bands that used to be at this level, and next thing you know they're you know who, remember what was that who that band you know you know yeah exactly. So so it's kind of like you know I I think me personally I made the decision that you know I really wanted to do another record. So I just invested myself 100 percent into that process. You know, and then when we sat down and we started talking about Musically, what we wanted to do, we, the one thing we knew is that we, that there needed to be a shift, you know, almost like a, a, a left turn, 
because just doing like the next logical step isn't it's not good enough you know because every two three four or five years there's a new crop of bands doing new things pushing the boundaries so you can't judge yourself by an old standard the standard constantly keeps moving you know that's why i have a lot of respect for bands like testament and exodus who don't they don't sound like old school bands they yeah. they are entrenched in the underground partially because they didn't become metallica or, or you know something like that so it's allowed them to kind of stay grounded and keep keep within like the current context you know so they're they're listening to new metal bands so they're actually sound like a current band that's what we want to do we don't want to sound like you know 2004 or what was going on what was going on there so it's definitely like making a big a big change you know which is exciting which is what we, we try to do all the time uh, from, you know so so when we go to do a record and we go to make a record it's literally a three-year contract you know it's it's a year of writing a record you know, it's a year and a half, maybe of touring, and then it's in six months of figuring out if you want to do it again. And then now our band is big enough to where a lot of people make a lot of money off of us, so we can't easily just say fuck it. You get, you basically get, get pressure. You know, it's yeah. like, like it's like our book agent, like, we're not take three, three and a half years again. Yeah. Things are going to be going. You know, and, and you know, there's a whole, you know, I don't say industry, not based on what what we do, but there's definitely, you know, the, it's it's bigger than just an individual. But, but I think from a hopeful standpoint, like I really wanted this record to be about hope because our last record was about destruction and you know a lot of like really heavy themes because it was right after Dimebag was killed and, and we we just got back and we wrote a record and you know it's called Constitution of Treason because for me the Dimebag murder was about people in America being so apathetic that violence doesn't really mean anything to them anymore you know and that they don't and, and that they're just driving themselves. It's like we live in the most free country in the world, but you see the most prisoners everywhere. You know what I mean? Like you go around, you know, drug addicts, you see homeless people, you see people complaining about the government. And that was, that album was about that. But this record, even though the record is probably darker than Constitution, I think, in certain aspects, I think as a whole, there is definitely a more hopeful sentiment at the end of the record. And it's because right now, like I think that's what like America and the world I think needs hopeful messages, but they need brutal reality and face and you know, the shit is fucked up. But at the same time, you know, don't 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 give up. You know? Your first DVD, Beneath the Scars of Glory and Progression, it's got you know cool live clips, documentary footage, uh, some music videos on that. How's the reception for the DVD been? It's been good. I mean, a lot of people like the documentary because they don't really know about our band, but when they find out and they see that we're really funny people and that we're like, we're actually a real band. Like, we do band things. We tell the, the good sides and the bad sides. Um, it hasn't really sold that many because the label didn't really push it that much, but I think that's, a, that's fine because a DVD can live on and people can get it as they go and they learn the band. And then I just think it's a cool little thing to put in a person's collection. I think even if you didn't like God forbid, I think you can enjoy the documentary. And if you do like God forbid, you'll enjoy the live concert. So in today's day and age where, you know, everything is straight to YouTube, straight to MySpace, or, you know, Headbangers Balls, sort of teetering, Metal Maniacs just went out of business. Is the label kind of behind you guys, you know, as far as making some new music videos for Earth's Blood, or have you already done that? Well, we, we, we did a music video just recently, but, um, I mean, our budget, we, we're probably going to do two music videos for this album cycle, unless the album gets bigger. Um, I don't know, I mean, they, they're behind us, but at the same time, like what you said, the game has changed, and, like, you know, you have to be self-sufficient, and for us, being self-sufficient isn't a problem, because we've always been self-sufficient. But I think that the label's doing it as best as they can at this point, you know, and, and I, I'm not complaining because they gotta do a lot more work, so I'll complain after the work is done. <laughs> so you guys are touring pretty extensively for Earth's Blood. You're going out on the No Fear Energy Music Tour alongside Children of Bodom and Lamb of God. Can fans expect to hear a lot of the tracks off the new album live? Uh, maybe just two. You know, we only have a 25 minute set. Wow. Yeah, so, but, I mean, yeah, they'll hear some new stuff, they'll hear some, like, I mean, we have five records, so we have actually have songs that are, like, hits for us, so we, so we, it's not going to be hard for us to fill up the set, but we'll definitely be playing some, um, some new stuff. And then, coincidentally, another Energy Drink tour, you know, the Rockstar Energy Drink <laughs> Mayhem tour is coming up with uh, Behemoth, Slayer, Cannibal Corpse, you guys are going to be on the Jägermeister stage. 
Uh, that must be huge for you. I mean, wasn't one of your earliest influences Slayer? Yeah, I mean, it's one of mine, but we, we toured with them on Ozfest, you know what I mean? And, and we did our off dates with them on Ozfest and Slipknot and Hatebreed. I, I'm not really, um, I, I don't really get excited for those big tours anymore because I look at them more as, you know, an opportunity and I recognize the opportunity now. Before, I'd be like, oh my God, and then I'd just go on tour and it'd be like this big old bash. Yeah. Now, it's like one of these things where it's like, okay, I'm at the show, what do I have to achieve? I have to achieve, I have to get people to get into the band, and I can have fun at the same time, but the opportunity of being on that tour, to me, is more important than the actual being on the tour, you know? Like, okay. And I've been keeping up with your blogs on the Metal Sucks website, and this past December, you encouraged fans and critics alike to be more upfront and vocal with their disliking of your music and, you know, drink some haterade. Yeah. How's that working out for you two months later? Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of working out, but the, now the, 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 the critics have gotten the record and they really like the record, so they're, if they're being honest, that's good, but um, I think, I actually, I think, it's, I think it's working, you know, because like, I think that there's more vocal people out there, and I think maybe Obama being elected, it's okay to like, you know, hate on the, hate on the Negro man these days, you know what I'm saying, because okay. we're not like a black band, and we don't play black music, but... You know, sometimes I think people are afraid to hate us because we are black, because they don't want to bring in any You're 100% black. Well, I'm, I'm half black, half white. Okay. You know I mean, my dad's white, mom's black, but I mean, I grew up in black culture. Yeah. I grew up, I mean, I, I mean, it's kind of funny. It's like they say, you know, if you have a drop of black, you know, you're black. And it, it's certain, it's, it's true in certain extents, you know what I mean? Like, but I don't look at myself as like a black man in America, you know what I mean? But at the same time, I look at it as like from the perception of someone else and they see our singer and they see our drummer, uh -huh. you know, and they don't like our band. They might not say anything because they don't want people to think that they're racist. It's a pretty idea. It's like me saying, the goddamn Mexican cut me off and, and people's looking at me and saying, you don't like Mexicans? I'm like, no, I just call them Mexican because the motherfucker was Mexican. So it's a damned like, if you do, damned if you don't. Think. It's always, it, it's, when is it not? Damned if you do, damned right. if you don't. You know what I mean? Okay, Tony from uh, Official Metal Castle TV. Touched on uh, Obama's and your point of view of having a first black president. What about how does it feel to be, God forbid, and having that ethnicity in a metal band? See, I, I, I was talking about it. I was like, I think we actually have a have a stake in, in his success. I was like, if he gets elected president, then our band can probably blow up. Because <laughs> because there's always been like that notion that like maybe we're not. You know, it's like we never really like ever said, oh, we're not big because people don't like black people or something. We, we, we just thought, you know, we were like, you know what, it's about the music. You know, and I really believe that. The music is good, and you're a good man live, that people will, will do, do, you know, really get into it. But then you start thinking about it, and you're like, man, oh, Seven Dust took out Kid Rock, he blew up, okay. They took out Stain, they blew up, took out Lip Biscuit. You're like, it's a damn conspiracy, how come that, you know? You start, you start thinking. I mean, look, we brought, we brought a trivium, the Vince Center, Paul, getting through. But, but, you know? but what, what that shows you is that, you know, the, the country can move in that direction, then, you know, that, that maybe that's not really an issue, and, and I don't know, it's just, it's just a good omen, if, if anything, if, you know, if you're not kind of looking too deeply in the point. Well, I mean, sometimes there's right times and the right places, you know, I mean, if you remember back in 2001, the way we came out, Century Media was like, look, a bunch of black motherfuckers playing metal. <laughs> there's a good black, they're black. You know what I'm saying? Body it's down. like, they're still trying to push Oh yeah, there's like, the these person, guys? They're black and black. Yeah. What are that supposed to mean? <laughs> they're not ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, as far as success is concerned with Obama, I do, I do think that him winning is going to help our band, but I don't think it's going to be like any direct sort of thing. I just think it's like a national conscious sort of thing. Because we noticed like we played a show in Kansas and like some dude loved our band but said he wouldn't buy the CD and he pointed to Doc, you know? And I was like, god damn, I'm standing right here, well, what shit, you can say that to your friend, you know what I mean? Like, and there's still people in the world like that, but I'm lighter than you. Yeah, no, exactly. I'm, I'm Mexican, man. <laughs> I love my people's band! It's about music! It's about that music! It's about music! It's about music! It's about music! Oh, it's But, um, no, I actually think that it has more to do with the fact that metal, metal fans love music, but at the same time, there's a lot of fear 
and be like, if we would have been like Slipknot and wore masks for like five years and then finally like, Rock and I'll be like, well look, here's the deal. I know you guys like God forbid. Take off your mask. <laughs> no, because I was thinking I was like uh, like Rob Halford, like no one knew he was gay. So it was like, what, what if you came out on day one? It's like, yes, I'm in Judas Priest. Motherfuckers were like, nah, man. Hey, hey, you saw, you saw hey, now, you break the law of sodomy. <laughs> Of all time, Jimmy Hendrix is black, so isn't that sort of a cop out? Well, there's actually a documentary um, called Electric Purgatory, which basically um, talks about the uh, or or examines the whole idea of, of the black rock movement and, and outside. They, and they talk about Jimmy Hendrix as kind of being the one. He's like he's like the the, the golden exception to to the rule. You know what I'm saying? Basically, if you don't have Either if you're very like kind of sexually ambiguous, like he talks, you know, they talk about like Michael Jackson and um, and Prince, He's right there. you know, He's right there. Um, you know, the, you know, and or or if you just have a, a hit song like like Living Color, you know, they they had a hit song, you know, um, that is it's just it's just difficult, and I think part of that has more to do with black culture than white culture because it's not that uh, white fans don't support black musicians, it's that black most you know black culture doesn't support black rock musicians you know and that's like a you know that's a kind of a deep sociological uh you know it's a, it's a broader question and, it, and it, you know it's kind of difficult to understand why we're kind of imprinted with these um kind of stereotypical uh cultural limitations you know and it has a lot to do with you know your environment your neighborhood your family you know it's like we weren't you know a lot of People other metal bands, you know, they grew up, their parents were playing them Skinner and Black Sabbath and all stuff, but we didn't grow up on any of that. You know, we basically have to discover it for ourselves. So I'm just, yeah, I don't know, man. The, the haterade is working. I, I want people to keep on hating. Yeah. Keep, keep hating. Drink haterade, do as much as you can, talk shit, because the people who like us will talk back. Another one of your blogs from the Metal Sucks website that I was, you know, just really reading that one was uh, you were talking about. The battle going on between Brett Michaels and uh, who was it, Def Leppard? Yeah, no, 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 no it, it was Ricky Rocket. It was Ricky Rocket. Ricky Rocket and, and, and yeah. Def Leppard. So Ricky Rocket's like a karate master, and I don't want to fuck with him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Sorry, Ricky. I mean, Brett Michaels. If he met you in the dark alley, you could pull out a king size Snickers. He goes into a <laughs> diabetic coma. End of the story. Yeah. But Ricky Rocket, you think he's more of a tough guy? Oh, I mean, I, th I think he choked me out and break my neck. But you know. I don't know, you know, it's kind of funny. I wrote that blog because I had been writing really heavy stuff, like really about like social culture. So I just kind of wanted to take a step out and just write about like pop culture. And I just made fun of the Def Leppard thing because I was like, those bands are soft bands. Like, yeah, they're not like, I don't mean soft as in they can't beat you up. I mean like their music isn't like strong. It's not like Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur. It's like Brett Michaels and the guy from Def Leppard. It's like, what's, like in the blog, I say, what's the most, I was like, unless someone's gonna catch a bullet, I don't give a fuck. I mean, you Jamie I mean? Jost is four feet tall, but he can hold his own. Oh yeah, I, I, I think he could cook, kick some ass. Yeah. I think he'd bust somebody's ass. So he's you, a little bit taller than that. I think he's like five, seven. You were saying in the blog that, you know, when your early influences back then was like Young MC and you saw these glam rockers on TV and thought they looked like a bunch of sissies, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did they look like that? Yeah, like a bunch of girls. See, I didn't I didn't realize that this this band of chicks was awesome, but these chicks are fucking hot, especially this one with the with the pouty lips. Oh wait. Oh wait, these are dudes. Oh, that's terrible. And that that um that was the next question is this guy right here, Christy Majors, okay, he got into a beef with his singer, Steve Sex Summers. Okay. He challenged him to a kickboxing match. So now, could you say with 100% certainty that in a knockdown straight uh, UFC type match, you could take that on? Uh, he, he, he would kick my ass. I mean, God he, forbid he lands a roundhouse kick. No, no, he doesn't even have to lay. He just, he's, he just needs to look at me scary like this. I'll fall right down. Look, look at me. <laughs> you, you don't even need to hit me, dude. Yo, 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 put, 
Put away those pouty lips, bro. I'm, I'm afraid already. You know what I'm saying? No, Does no, no. Does he need to drink some Haterade? No, no, no. He doesn't need to drink. I don't He's want. Ready. Him, I don't want him to even know who I am. Yeah. Okay. Don't, 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 don't let him let him know who I am. I don't want to get knocked out on camera. Uh, Dallas, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk metal with me today. Before we wrap this up, any last words for your fans? Yeah. Drink Haterade. Actually, don't. No. Our fans, I love you guys. Fans who. You know people who don't like us? Tell them to keep saying talking shit. So much shit. I want so much shit. Any okay. last words for Christy Majors from Pretty Boy Floyd? Um, no. Don't kick my ass. Okay? <laughs>